Welcome to Paying Attention with me, Nicholas Gruen, and my friend, Peyton Bowman. Uh, Today, we're going to ask ourselves the question, do we focus too much on preventing failure and not enough on promoting human flourishing, promoting success uh, in our jobs and in our lives? With that, over to Peyton. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, Yes, I've been looking forward to discussing this topic with you um, because I think there are a lot of ways in which your particular way of looking at the world can can give us some insights into these ideas. And I, I'm sharing with you a slide uh, from uh, one of your one of your uh, kind of materials about yep. it, it looks like human failure. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what, what's happening. Human failure. That's right. Human failure is not far from uh, not far away from this fellow. And um, So this is from the very first of a series of videos that you know I'm working on and many people will not, but now they do. And uh, it's really trying to explain a way of looking at the world from the ground up. And uh, this is a guy on his own and he's not... uh, Now, you know that story we tell ourselves that uh, we are the apex species on this planet because we're so clever. Uh, we came up with all these ideas, and what was this lion ever going to do? How was this lion ever going to worry us? Because we came up with spears and various other things. And the thing is that that there's a, there's an important way in which that is wrong. This guy, because the next scene in the in the video shows you that the lion turns tail, but only when we get together. So our, and that isn't just, that's not just a story about how we all need to cooperate to fight off a lion. What, that's a story about human intelligence. Humans, pay attention here, humans are not cleverer than chimpanzees, except together, except when they've learned language, when they, which they can only learn off each other, except when they swap ideas and talk to each other, they, we became the primate that solves problems on the African savanna there. So it's the collective intelligence of those five people chasing the lion that gave us the spears and the other things that we needed. That's a really big thing that that is our most precious human capacity and this is something we probably may well talk about more we've talked about in the past but it implies a a bunch of things about what we should think of as the most important parts of our society yeah and i think it's definitely important to note how it's not just the fact that there's a big group of people who are fighting one creature that makes them more powerful but it's the the ability to think and organize that other animals can't do. So, you know, last, you gave me the example another time where uh, two chimpanzees can't pick up a log together to move it out of the way. They can't lift up a branch to help someone get through the forest a little bit easier. They yeah, just don't so, have that mental So no capacity. other animal, yeah, so no other animal is capable of thinking, we will do this. We will pick fruit. Therefore, I will lower the branch and you will pick it. That's extraordinary, but mm. that is that's a complete paradigm of human thinking. So it's not just kind of cooperate. Let's cooperate. It is this capacity to imagine ourselves as a purposive we, and that doesn't happen among uh, among even 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 our closest primates. Yeah. So uh, this this uh, kind of ability of a public sphere and a private sphere becomes very important to human life. I, you know, I think that's that's something you've spoken of in the past. Yeah. Well. So, so this is my working up of of the idea of the of the economist's idea of a public good. What's a public good? A public good is a thing like a road, and a private good is a thing like a car, and they are no use without each other. And what I'm arguing in this diagram, and then in the next diagram, is that that's true of our conversation, it's true of a school, it's true of any human institution, that it has, that that every, that it has private aspects and that it has 
shared aspects and they need to be related in a healthy way to each other. And one of the ways in which a society becomes unhealthy, the one of the ways in which an, a, an institution becomes unhealthy, think of a queue where people are pushing in. Uh, what happens is that that is an imbalance, an unhealthy relationship between the private interests of each of the individual people in the queue and the shared interest of everyone wanting to access the efficiency and the fairness of the queue. So those, so, so that to me is the most important thing. That's the thing, the residue of this thing about us, this capacity to think as a group of we's, this capacity for shared intentionality, we have to keep that healthy or our or the place falls apart. Have a look around at some of the things that are falling apart. Yeah. So, you know, we are planning to talk about human success. So that's that seems like a pretty private idea, right? I mean, if I'm successful, uh, if, if that's sort of your your area of interest, you know, how how can we create society that that promotes this private success without everything kind of collapsing and things becoming yeah, unfair? That's right. That's right. So and so and so, I proposed for today to talk about this thing that Eleanor Ostrom uh, said in uh, whenever it is 2009 in her lecture receiving the Nobel Prize in Economics. She was a political scientist. Didn't think of herself as an economist, but political scientist who was looking at the social and political uh, infrastructure of economic institutions. And I use this quote a lot. And she says, it's significant that she's a woman, just by the way, for in terms of the content. And she says, we've got ourselves carried away with this idea of trying to build institutions that um, function well with purely self-interested individuals. I completely agree with her that, that firstly, that that's important, or uh, I, I agree with the mainstream that she's taking exception to, that that is very important. I think it is one of the miracles of the modern world that we've tried to, that we discovered that markets do this incredibly well, that they harness self-interest for social purposes, um, but not perfectly. And then people like Alexander Hamilton were thinking the same thing about the American Constitution. How do we build a constitution so that actors within political actors acting in their own self-interest end up supporting something that's socially healthy? All good, all fine, just don't get carried away with it because there's another question. And that other question is, how do we design institutions to bring out the best in humans? And... Um, and, and so I think that's a really good contrasting question to ask. Um, it isn't quite the way I would want to put it. And I wanted to ask you what, whether you think, whether you're happy with it or whether you would, add, whether you would put the same idea in a somewhat different way. And, uh, then I'll have a crack at doing, doing, um, doing the same. Yeah, well, I think it's it's kind of interesting in the sense that how you define the best in a human being, uh, and so I think that having grown up maybe in a in a society, in the United States, and especially in the '90s, where this kind of capitalist idea of, uh, of you know competition um, really reached a peak and seemed to be very successful. You know, thinking of the best, I think we t think of uh, in a lot of ways in terms of private success, you know, whether yeah. that's making money or it could also just be artistic achievement uh, that belongs to the artist in some ways or, yeah. um, you know, uh, success in academia or any, any sphere <clears throat> focuses on how the individual or, you know, sport, for example, you know, the, is it really about... Um, you know, it's about the winning people, not the losing people, and about not necessarily about the whole society of uh, of people involved in playing the game and, and being connected to a game. So, yeah. 
I kind of have a question in the way this seems to bring to flip that Hamiltonian model on its head where it was, okay, how can we create, we know that people basically are selfish. And so how do we use that to make a, a good society versus how can we make a society to promote the best, but does that best mean, you know, the best for the individual or the best for yeah. everybody or what does that, yeah. that mean exactly? Yeah. yeah. So, so my sort of critique of it or my way of looking at this is that, it's a very utilitarian framework. When she says extensive empirical research leads me to argue, well, it's very, it's a funny sort of thing. You, you don't hear, you know, a priest or a psychologist talking about extensive empirical research, particularly, well, I suppose you would, a, you would a psychologist, but what's the empirical research into? Well, Eleanor Ostrom did a lot of research into um, uh, into the management of common pool resource problems, and that is, say, a lake which everyone can fish at, and so how do you stop people overfishing the lake? Mm -hmm. And she did a lot of research into police forces where, uh, ur urban police forces, where everybody was arguing that if you make these management structures bigger, you'll get economies of scale, and she mm -hmm. showed that you get, maybe you get some economies of scale and you get worse policing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so what she's appealing to there is the utility. She's really talking about social utility, not individual utility, particularly, yeah. I think. But she's a, but but it's still about her proof of that something's good is that it works out for the institution. And what I want to mm. say is that I want it to work out for the institution. I think that's a great test, mm. but it's not the only test. And ultimately, institutions are full of people and the ultimate question is are they i think is are they is is this institution a way in which the human being can find a way to flourish individually while they develop a healthy relationship with the rest of the world uh so so it's not quite the flavor i would give it but it's it's kind of 90 percent there and um and it, it asks all the right questions i think which i want to talk about in this uh discussion so to take ex the example of the police force, you know, obviously making it bigger, well, you would think it would improve the quality of police work or the success of the police force, however you define that. And what you're saying is that you also want to see how an institution can be improved by, for example, improving the, the individual success of the police officers in the police force or the people who yes, are working yes, in the police force? Or? Well, I see everything in an institution as a series of relationships between the people inside the institution with others inside the institution and also with the purpose of that institution, mm. which then brings in mm. other people. I want, I mean, this sounds like a kind of an eerie fairy thing to say, but I want all those relate, uh, the, my, the test for me isn't that we've lowered costs and got the same policing outputs. Right. That's great. That's healthy. That's a good sign. We might be on the right, on the right track, but I want everyone to, I want this to uh, help everyone relate to each other. I want mm. it to honour human beings' ability to flourish in the context of collective intentionality, which, uh, you know, that's what we are. We're not happy. Uh, just, uh, you know, we can't do anything on our own. We can, we, we can take leave of the world and do some mathematics or writing or something, but it's got to relate to others if we are going to flourish. That's my assertion. And that's what I think, you know, that's what I, that's what I think we should be thinking about. And the point here, which Eleanor Ostrom introduces us to, uh, but, but so does the Toyota production system and so does peer production like Wikipedia and Linux coding and microcredit is that there are so many ways in which imp improved relations between people makes us massively uh, makes us massively more productive and happier and and more like flourishing human beings and addresses the and addresses the the the, the things that are wrong about the way we've got things set up and of course 
we're going to have to go on doing that forever because we'll never get it perfect. But uh, this is the way to get us on. I want to get on some kind of upward trajectory, which we might talk a bit about later. Okay, great. Well, so you shared, uh, you put some images on another slide. Um, shall we talk about these? Yeah, let's. And maybe you could tell me a bit about this. So, so it occurred to me that a good way into this, because I want to talk about the way we, the way we um, structure our institutions. And I like this story of, uh, I like to think about uh, amateur versus professional sport. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying, gee, let's try and get back to amateur sport. There were various things that were wrong with amateur sport, uh, uh, you know, um, and even if I wanted to say, let's get back to amateur sport, that was a product of a different society. Mm. But I think it is really worthwhile looking at what amateur... If you ask the question, if you ask Eleanor Ostrom's question, um, was amateur sport a richer... Did it provide a richer environment for human flourishing than professional sport? Mm. And I think the answer to that is an emphatic yes, hmm. most anyway, mostly yes. And of course, I want to kind of dispense with some of the class snobbery of amateur yeah. sport, the, the various bits of baggage. Why is it better? Because it's a, it is the whole culture asserting a collective interest in, in us remembering that sport is a metaphor. Hmm. It's a metaphor for life. Um, and... If you win Wimbledon, if you won Wimbledon, this and the 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 picture on the left is, I have to tell you, an Australian <laughs> tennis star, a guy called John Newcomb, and that was the last amateur Wimbledon in 1967. And um, if you so, John Newcomb was always going to have a pretty good life. He would, if he needed to make some money after his amateur career. Well, firstly, he could turn pro, and that was sort of operated alongside the amateur system. But you then, you fell out of the limelight. You're actually a better player, but you fell out of the limelight, and everybody focused on the TV coverage and so on, focused on um, amateur sport. Um, so um, why is that better? Because it was just in a simple utilitarian sense, it shares the love around. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, Roger Federer, uh, Novak Djokovic, they're all worth 100 million or more. They don't need 100 million. A few million is good. Um, uh, everyone knows that, that, that if they made nothing out of it, most successful sports people from the amateur era um, felt good about that. Mm. Um, so, and, and, and the other thing that I want to just show you there, and this is um, uh, so, so the picture on the right is John Newcomb winning the, uh, don't think it was the first, no, I don't think it was. It was John Newcomb, I don't know, I think it was 1970, 70, 71, something like that. Um, and that's a professor. So he's won, the, he's won Wimbledon, the Wimbledon Open there. And look at the difference. Look at the difference of the theatre. So this is, on the left, he's playing this. I put the, the German's name there so that I would remember what it is. <laughs> I could read it. Uh, Wil, Wilhelm Bungert. And he's won the game. He won it in straight sets. It was an easy game for him. And there he is showing off the trophy, which mysteriously is a much smaller trophy than the other one, although, in fact, the other one goes back a long way. Uh, as well, but somehow he's holding a more modest trophy, which appeals to me. And he's inviting his his former opponent to share in the moment, mm. and there is a sense of honour. There he is on the in the middle, jumping over the net to go and shake hands. And uh, you can watch it. You can watch this. Uh, you, you know there are videos of this. So so there's a different there's a the, the, there are different signals being sent here. And what's happening in amateur sport is that it's constraining competition. It's saying, look, there is competition, but it's competition that is framed around honour. It's framed around uh, the achievement of the young, the, you know, it's not whether you win or lose, but how you play the game, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, there was a fair bit of outrage when, 
people like John McEnroe arrived on the scene, and that was early in the open era uh, in the 70s. And people were just appalled at the way in which John McEnroe kind of lost it all the time. And that was that would just not have been tolerated um, just five or 10 years before. They would have just said, look, I'm sorry, we're not here for this kind of thing. And, and if you can't shut your mouth um, and behave as an entertainer for these people, you're, you're going to get some luck and you're going to get some bad luck. Um, and mostly you'll be wrong about it because you're very biased uh, being a competitor, then then off you go. Uh, so so there are lots of ways in which the, the cultural value of sport is degraded by taking what obviously has to be competitive and intensely competitive and turning and and allowing that competition to colonize more and more and more of the game mm -hmm. and that to me anyway i wanted to talk about uh, i wanted to discuss this on the way to discussing other institutions and i've coined this expression decompetitive institutions mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's not me pining away nostalgically for the days of amateur sport. It's just a way into a subject. And yeah. that subject is what are the ways in which we've taken competition too far, as useful, as, as wonderful as competition can be. Uh, and um, uh, so, so, again, just to, to uh, make one other point using sport, one thing that's happened with sport in, throughout the Western world is that we've tended to go from a local, at least in Australia's case, suburban model, uh, in America's case, urban, an urban model or a city by city model. And over the course of a generation, it turns into effectively a commercial model. Mm. Um, the British comedian Ben Elton, I remember saying, uh, you know, I was trying to work out what we were barracking for because, of course, we were all barracking. We thought we were barracking for Liverpool, but then their players went somewhere else and we didn't follow the players. We stayed barracking for Liverpool. And then Liverpool picked up a whole bunch of other players that we used to boo and all this kind of stuff. And he said, well, I've, I've kind of realised that really all we're barracking for is a bunch of jumpers running around on the oval. And yeah. that was not what people barracked for a generation or two before. They barracked for their community. Uh, and I think the most – And now, I, again, I'm not really wanting to set the clock back, but I think the most poignant way of putting this, and, and, and most, countries, most countries have an experience of this, we do in Australia, which is that the management of the league picks some struggling, straggling club and – rebadges it and moves it and and that's a quite a that's like grabbing someone's teddy bear and holding <laughs> hosting it for auction it's it's a it's an awful thing to do yeah. for the people who are old timers who have who who are proud to have supported this club which represents their suburb uh and they just sort of wrench it off them and say no no it's better marketing this happened in a in australia with a number of clubs and uh, we had a club called – it was a Australian football star. Its biggest representation was in Victoria, and it's in the southern states, and there were interstate matches. But then what happened is we set up what we call the Australian Football League instead of – so the AFL rather than the VFL, and um, Fitzroy and South Melbourne were ship moved to Brisbane and Sydney, respectively. And people were pretty upset about that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I sympathise with them. I'm not saying it shouldn't have happened. Um, well, I am. I think I am saying it should have It should have happened in a different kind of way. And uh, really, the people who were managing it didn't really care about that stuff. They just wanted to, uh, they wanted a, a more intense competition uh, and, you um, and a more even competition. So that's kind of good in some ways. Uh, but these are big values that move us very considerably, and each of them is moving in a very recognisably hyper-competitive direction. 
But I think it, you know, the professionalization of sport really illustrates how uh, this idea of how the private can colonize, as you as you sometimes put it, the uh, the public sphere. So you know, a good example of this is that also an American college, you know, collegiate sports. So you have, uh, you know, this was traditionally a very community model, you know, uh, on some s smaller teams, just some average person from the school could potentially have tried out to get on the, the team and play basketball or football in, in the old days. But now uh, these college teams, the football teams, the basketball teams in particular, they make so much money and the coaches make so much more money than the professors at the universities that they're connected to. But then you have these players who are still, who are basically semi-professional players, but they're not being paid any money. Yeah. But then people say, well, this is a form of, of slavery in a way. Like, yeah. why, are, yeah. why are we not paying these players who are making so much, who are generating so much revenue for these schools? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it becomes a very, it becomes hard to defend the position that, you shouldn't pay these college athletes money. And then it becomes a question, well, what's the, you know, what's the relationship to the university in the first place? There's, there's basically a very tenuous one. Well, that's right. But you see, the critical part of your story there is these rent seekers, these people at the top who are creaming the rent. Yeah. The way I would put this is to say that it's a completely arbitrary, I mean, if people are very skillful and people want to come and watch them. That's terrific. Um, but the, but, but do they own the game? Do they own the rent? So let's say that uh, college football, let's say the, the earnings, the revenue of college football, the amount available to pay those who put it on in America is $200 million a year. Um, do, the coaches own it and the players not? Well, that's pretty unfair. We will agree. Do the players own it and the coaches own it? Hello, we're the public out here, yeah. and why don't we own it? Yeah. So my answer to that is a sort of a pure answer. It's not a pra – uh, I'm not saying uh, – you know, I'm not deducing from this exactly what we should do. I don't know enough about the situation in the United States, but I always ask this question – why is it that the players and the coaches and the organizations have all the rights to sell TV rights, close the stadiums, jack up the prices? I mean, no problem. They're selling a product. The yeah. product is, it's like the English language. The product is a code and, and the people have every much as collective right to speak of themselves as the owner. They just played themselves out of the ownership as the public usually do because there's a lot of people in the public and they don't sort of concentrate together to do this. Uh, mm. But, um, you know, uh, that was the way in which suburban clubs worked. Uh, they, would, um, they would get money, they would collect money on a kind of quasi-charitable basis. They would charge people to get into the stadiums and the point was to try to pay struggling locals who were talented at this game a little bit of money and but the idea was to keep everything uh you know the idea was not to maximize anyone's revenue it was to run a community event mm -hmm. um and so that to me there's a lot that, that, that there's a lot to like about that and and, and we can see what happens when it becomes purely commercial. There's no greater rhyme or reason as to why it should be players, coaches, organisations or the public, but look what happens. The, yeah. the, the, the people who are close in to the organisation, they, they just turn it to their own advantage. Not good. And uh, so now, having talked about sport, we can sort of take some of those ideas and and ask some other questions uh, about uh, uh, about our society. Although we've um, spent so much time doing that, that maybe we'll do it uh, a little superficially and maybe come back to it. Who knows? But I've so so the, as I've thought about these things, I've been thinking about um, 
I've been thinking about different institutions and ways in which institutions corral competition or in f competition and I would add self-assertion or in fact completely interdict competition. Basically say we're interested in choosing the best but we're not interested in having a competition about who is the best. I think some people listening to this might think what could that be? Mm. Um, well, I don't know. Think about the Pope, how the Pope selected. I don't know whether, I don't think Pope's campaign. <laughs> I think Pope's, yeah, exactly, yeah. who knows? <laughs> Ideally, I, I guess what I'm trying to unpack for somebody listening to this, they, they, they can, I think they can intuitively grasp the idea that the best Pope might not be chosen by having everyone run campaigns and work out who who campaigns the best. So so that's that's how you can start thinking about constraints on competition. And so I've got this list if you go on to the next slide. Um, and and the first sort of set of decompetitive institutions is constraints on choice. And I, I like quoting the 16th century, is it 16th century? No, it's not. It's 17th century uh, British uh, English Civil War, in which the parliamentary forces against King jo uh, King Charles were not going very well, and they put through a thing called the self-denying ordinance. And this basically said that if you were a if you were a parliamentarian, you couldn't be a general in the army. And if you were a general in the army, you couldn't be a parliamentarian. You had to choose. And the and, and so that what's happening there is that you're getting the beginnings of separation of powers. And separation of powers, separation of duties is a way of focusing competition on particular things and then drawing a boundary around it and saying, we don't want competition beyond these bounds. Um, the old law of agency which we could do with a lot more of is I was a rule that said that if you held yourself out as someone's agent, think about a think about Goldman Sachs, for instance, advising people which um, uh, which securities to buy, then you could only be their agent, and there was you could do nothing that would conflict with your duty to look at things from your from the point of view of the person you were representing. Well, that's gone out with poke bonnets. Uh, it was expensive and protected integrity. And in those kinds of transactions, protecting integrity is more important than scale, as yeah. we've discovered. And it is not very expensive. It's just that uh, you know, you don't just say, oh, gee, economies of scale, aren't they terrific? A bit like uh, Eleanor Ostrom and the police. Um, uh, so, and the other one I've got there, uh, and, and that sort of survives, but in a rather ad hoc way, all over the place where people pick up that there are conflicts of interest and they say, you yeah. should, you, we should draw a boundary around your ability to compete defined by preventing you from having conflict of interest. Yeah. So that's the that's the most sort of simple and basic uh, of those institutions. Uh, but then there's the question of selecting for merit. And people have, um, who've watched some of these programs have, know that, that I think that's a, a big deal. Uh, so I thought we could, um, have a bit of a we, we can talk a bit about that too yeah well, i think that that's I, I mean in terms of selecting for merit so these might include the kind of elections that you sort of alluded to whether you thought the the pope was selected exactly. by campaigning exactly. or by yep. he was meritorious in the sense that I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I guess you could talk about the two recent popes because they were very different people uh, in terms of their political ideology, in terms of their their uh, their kind of academic background. But um, and and were they know, both were they both Jesuits? 
Well, I mean, I think without this is not an area where I have a whole lot. All of right. Well, anyway, but I, I do think that. Um. Well, yeah, the Pope. Well, that whole the whole election is shrouded in mystery, and there's a lot of strange yeah. things, especially the most recent one, because the the this the the Pope before this last one abdicated, which has only happened like once before in all the history of the Church, and that that was a strange yeah. situation. Um, but uh, you know, I do I do think if you think about school captains, you know, this is a good example. So when I was when I was playing, you know, when I, when I was in. Uh, high school and doing sports, we selected the, our, our team captains, and mm -hmm. they weren't necessarily the best, um, the best athletes on the team. They yeah. were usually pretty good. They were usually near the top of the scale, but they weren't necessarily the stars of the team. But they, we yeah. chose them based on some some sense of their leadership ability. Exactly, exactly. And we there's a famous, uh, well, yes, uh, the, the Geelong, which is a club in Melbourne, football club in Melbourne had a similar approach. They appointed uh, you know, one of their players who was regarded as a bit of a utility sort of player, not, not a star, but he was uh, he just was a real uh, trier and uh, they thought he would make a good captain. Yeah. Um, so so the, the basic idea there is that, and I think it's a terribly important idea, the idea of staying focused on getting the best people for jobs but being aware that in ways that are often quite subtle, not always, allowing, uh, uh, predicating this choice on individuals asserting themselves against each other for the choice of some superior. That uh, now, in the case of an election, the superior is the opinion of the people who are voting. But in all of these cases, you are conjuring up a theatricality which does not address the shared interest. The theatricality ultimately focuses on the interest of those who are asserting themselves. And so in Australia, we're now having a, an election campaign and it's extraordinary and excruciating to, to watch the degree to which media attention is focused on the competition between individuals and not on the way in which that competition between individuals is supposed to be serving a shared interest. It's it's kind of almost completely gone mm. that, that media coverage might be about the people mm. rather than the performances that are there for our, you know, our connoisseurship about who's a better Who's who's done a better job the, today? Although usually it is who's managed to avoid cock-ups the most successfully. Um, it's you know so so our prime minister visits an aged care home and then gets harangued by some stray uh, person in an aged care home. Well, uh, well anyway, that's what gets covered. Um, now, of course, he's the prime minister is hardly a hardly innocent of all this. He's gone to try and set up a nice meeting and he got a bad meeting and that becomes the, the story. And in the meantime, is he is are his policies likely to deliver a good aged care system or not? Yeah. No that's not on the news. There's nothing there's nothing about that. So uh, and and so this is a this is a piece of wisdom that is well it it exists in our community. It's just in eclipse, as it were. So a club will typically appoint a leader by, you know, people circulating and saying, you know, I really think that chap would be the right person. Back a generation ago in academia, the heads of departments were usually people who agreed to do it reluctantly because <laughs> they really wanted to get on with their academic work. They agreed to do it reluctantly. They got a 20% more for their duties. And then they, after a couple of years, somebody else took over. Well, that's now completely different. And vice chancellors around the world, and particularly it turns out in Australia, Australia is a particularly egregious example. Vice chancellors are paid um, over a million dollars. Um, and the academics, the best academics are paid two 
to max three hundred thousand um, yeah. dollars, and this is for being successful rent seekers. Uh, yeah. So this is just, I think, completely catastrophic for an organisation which isn't, you know, thought isn't. Yes, there's a self that there is a uh, that there's a room for competition and self-assertion in thinking, but but uh, it's a it's a it, there is something inherently collaborative about it, and we want people, we want a sort of degree of collegiality as well as a preparedness to challenge your colleagues, even if it's going to take you quite a lot of time and you won't, you might spend a week or two challenging a colleague's ideas and you'll never write, and that's two weeks' time that you could have written an article and you won't because you're contributing to the the sort of social fabric of those ideas, if you like, the shared, the shared goals. So these things are tremendously important, I think, and massively underplayed in our system. Um, and uh, so that's, so, so, but all we've got in that second group of things, with the exception of the last one, uh, which I'll talk about after I go on to the next point, Let's see if I can highlight that one in real time, see if it works. Uh, is it now gone yellow? It has on mine. That's all right. It hasn't on yours. That's fine. Don't well, don't refresh it. Um, is uh, so, so all that decompetitive merit selection has done there is that it has, it's basically something that could be merit selection by competition, and we've just made a rule that we're going to try and stop competition. And then there are ways of selection that really just uh, a much more a much more profound interdiction of competition obviously uh, the most the, the most obvious way of doing this is in a jury whether it's a legal jury or a citizens jury like a citizens assembly you sample from the community select 100 people at random uh, obviously they didn't compete for their role um, and then I've got that at the bottom, the decompetitive merit selection. This is this hybrid institution, which I thought was magnificent when I heard about it. And it is, um, it was arrived at with the, it was arrived at in the South Australian, in a South Australian citizen jury where there are 340 jurors. They needed spokespeople. So they needed a, sub, a small subgroup of people who could be spokespeople. And the way they did it, was that they randomised this? They they got a group of people together. They got those people to spend an hour. These are some of the jurors. They got those people to spend an hour determining the criteria according to which they should choose spokespeople, and another hour debating which fifteen of the three hundred and forty best fit those criteria. Went out, checked with those people that they were okay about it, and that's how they chose. Now I think that's just a a really interesting thing to think about. It's really interesting to think, firstly, where else might that work well? I think it would work well. It's, it, I think it would work well in universities, in public service agencies, in all kinds of places, you know, possibly with quite a bit of, of the traditional sort of competitively based activity as well. Um, and, and there are two good things about it, two things to think about it. One is who you get, and the second is what kind of incentives it sets off for people who would like to aspire to those more senior positions. And it seems to me that if you were in this group and you knew that was the selection mechanism, <coughs> you'd be keener to listen to people, you'd be keener to help people, you wouldn't spend all your time trying to take credit for somebody else's work, trying to protect your ass and all that sort of stuff. So. Uh, I think that that can produce all kinds of really worthwhile things and that it answers Eleanor Rostrom's question, which is how do we build institutions that bring out the best in people? Yeah. Well, and I think um, you could probably get into the psychology of com competition and, and find some interesting things there, but it does kind of get to this question of, uh, you brought up before of isegoria, right? There's a there's a need that you want to be heard, right? To feel like you're participating and that your participation yeah. is valued. 
Yeah. And uh, sure. building, you know, this this process by which this spokespeople and this for the citizens jury, it kind of takes into account a lot of different perspectives of the people involved without necessarily putting them up putting them all up on stage and making them kind of fight yeah. it out for what's going to right. be. That's right. That's right. And if you're t talking about isegoria, which, if anyone's wondering, is an ancient Greek word meaning not freedom of speech but equality of speech, then as we talked about when we talked about the Australian uh, footballer called Mal Meninga who went into politics and couldn't survive his first interview, he realised he would just couldn't bear the, the way he would have to talk, all the bullshit he'd have to talk. Uh, if you want real isegoria, if you want real equality of speech, you have to take into account that, you know, 50, 60 percent of people are like Mal Meninga. They really don't like this. Mm. This, you know, they don't like saying I'm better than other people. They think that's unseemly. There's deep wisdom in that, which maybe we can talk about sometime. Uh, so it's part of a kind of psychological equality of speech to find a way to promote people who will not, who are not don't like the idea of promoting themselves. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe what we can do, given that we're now at the 46th minute of this, is yeah. maybe just very quickly introduce an idea and then um, maybe we can explore that uh, in a future. Uh, yeah, I or... think that's that's great. And it... so you want to discuss the idea of, of preferences. So I want you to put up a picture of a hamburger yeah. and chips and a Coke. <laughs> Yeah. And looks so good. one of my one of my right. concepts of what's gone wrong with the world is fast foodification. And what's happened there is that when is it was his name Ray Kroc? Anyway, when when the guy who kind of bought out McDonald's and turned it into a gigantic uh, a, a gigantic multinational corporation, they were making good hamburgers and they got very serious about market research and they tuned the amount of salt, sugar, and fat, and the kind of advertising to maximize profits. And that does, that sounds like a reasonably harmless thing to do. And on its own, a, ham, a McDonald's hamburger is a reasonably harmless, in fact, quite a nice thing. And I try and have one about once every three or four months. Uh, but that's not their game. Their game is to try to uh, addict you, if you like, to try to provide for you exactly what you want right now. And so that's where I think a really important concept is, and I don't really like the terminology, I'd like something with a bit more kind of richness, human richness about it, but this distinction between primary preferences, which is what you want, and secondary preferences, which are, if you like, acquired tastes or what you want to want. And it seems to me that human life is empty and base if it's just around and thin as opposed to thick. I, don't, I won't bother trying to define that. If it's just around maximising existing preferences, because almost all of us get the idea that in the future we want to have slightly better preferences. Almost all of us understand the idea that William James, the American pragmatist philosopher, had that one's life is about developing one's character, developing progressively better habits that support uh, a calmer, better life and enable you, you know, stabilize you around what it is you is that is most valuable to you and what you might be able to leave to your children and the next generation. So uh, that's, again, something which is kind of being cleaned out by hyper competition. And I would argue that fast foodification hasn't just happened in fast food. It's sort of happened throughout our culture. Um, but, yeah. yeah. And I, I think uh, another way, I, I, I think a good example that I might add to this whole primary versus secondary preferences that I think can help illustrate is you know, we all want to be maybe the kind of person, or not maybe we all, but let's say I want to be the kind of person who who has seen or who watches, let's say, movies that are of high artistic merit. You know, maybe I've watched all the Hitchcock films or all the or Scorsese, yeah. or whatever, whoever it be, pick your favorite director or the person you think is the most, um, you know, interesting, avant-garde or whatever it be, and to be knowledgeable about that area. 
But then on, you know, Friday night, I'm, I'm tired from work. Yeah. And I open up Netflix and they've got, I don't know, Ace Ventura, Pit Detective. And yeah. I'm just like, oh, and you I'm like watch watching it. that right now. And it's, it's easy. Good. It's so Fine. much easier to yeah. get to that yeah. point. That's so, right. That's right. Um, so so they're constantly pitching that to you like a McDonald's hamburger. And I've got nothing wrong. I've got nothing yeah, against yeah. any of that. But if you make it your full-on diet, it conceals uh, better possibilities from you. And those better possibilities just require a little more patience from you, and then you'll feel better for having acquired those preferences. Yeah. and Like know, going to the of, gym. And then it sort of a little bit connects to some of our, our discussion around uh, ancient philosophy, ancient moral philosophy. It, it sort of prevents you from becoming – a certain kind of person because you you sort of stay in that static position yeah. where you were before. So Yeah. Well, um, I'd love you to maybe next time or in a future time, you know, give us maybe there is a, an, a language from ancient philosophy that's mm. rather richer than primary and secondary preferences. I mean, I just think that's an awful terminology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, kind of, it's very – I like the term, but, um, yeah, I'll look into that and we'll, we'll talk about that. But yeah, I think it would be very interesting to kind of go a little bit deeper into how a good institution or creating good institutions could support people from getting beyond those primary preferences, yeah. getting to those secondary preferences and yeah. understanding, you know, the role of the public life in supporting and, and helping people yeah. flourish in that particular Yeah, yeah, life. yeah. And, and, and it was always the case, and it's still the case, but it was always the case in spades that the public culture into which we were inducted was a mechanism for moving us from fairly simple primary preferences to richer preferences. Mm -hmm. um, you, you won't find any traditional ethnic food that is like McDonald's. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been enriched by people's experience. Um, you, you you will find that um, that the the myths that people you know ancient myths and so on Greek myths to take an example uh, Norse myths there's they're not uh, uh, now Disney takes them and kind of fast foodifies them I think makes them sentimental makes them is you know is desperate to explain them to us and make us feel good about them. But these myths, certainly Greek myths, are full of mystery and power uh, and they're simple stories, but they live with us and help us reflect on life in a way that Disney mostly doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I have a five-year-old daughter, so I, I can well, speak to Disney's this pretty cool. directly it's these like days. And, yeah, there's no, no more egregious example of that than The Little Mermaid, which in the original is a very horribly sad story and then the uh, disney version has a very nice happy ending but um yeah well that might it, be all right for a five-year-old that's good <laughs> yeah yeah of course i mean I, I i don't like telling her the real story because it's very yeah. sad but well but puff the case, magic uh, i cried when i was a little kid at puff the magic dragon and my son cried as well that's a sad sad song <laughs> yeah yeah jackie paper came no more <laughs> yeah yeah well there's still some of those things that that but but anyway, that that is a very interesting point, and um, I think Disney is a is a good example of a, a company that you know actually in its early days took a lot of risks and and yeah. really tried to uh, I mean something like Sleeping Beauty was uh, ex incredibly expensive to create. Yeah, and well, Snow White was pretty. And, Snow White was pretty tough too. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah exactly. But, exactly. But now they figured out okay, well we're going to connect. Well, this. they're a formula. They're a yeah. rent. They're now yeah. rent seekers, and yeah. they're very good at it. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes that – I mean, one of the nice things is that things like Netflix and some of the things that have happened in media, they haven't all dragged things down. They've mm. sort of uh, – you know, there is a market, uh, sort of a – you sense the Sopranos and so on. There is a market for good stuff on, on our screens. But, you know, most of the money, most of the production goes into – fast foodified content like lots of reality TV, which I also must say my kids watch a fair bit of and I like watching the finals and, mm. you know, having it on in the background. So it's, yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not against it. It's just that I want a bit more. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing. It's a, it's about how, well, and then you get to a point where I guess the, the secondary preferences become primary and then you sort of, exactly. I mean, that's the, that's the idea is an institution should promote growth. Exactly. Exactly. So you start out, well, for, if you're five years old, actually watching maybe something like um, Pinocchio can be quite challenging. <laughs> and then you kind of get to the point where it's sort of, it, it, you have to sort of look beyond it. So yeah. I think that yeah. that's, um, that's a good place to kind of pause on our conversation. Um, but I, I think there's a lot more to be said there. And I look forward to talking with you about this more in the future. Sounds good. All Thanks, right. Peyton.